started up. I wasn't sure whether we continue this one, so I had a yes. Introduction. Um, my presentation will be in many ways um, very different from uh, the two previous ones, um, but at the same time it's perfectly complementary. Um, I don't contradict or disagree with anything previous speakers have said. At the same time, uh, Miguel has done a great job in getting three speakers without, I think, any of us communicating with each other before the seminar but having three very distinct uh, contributions uh, that don't repeat each other. Um, so I think we have a very neat set of uh, presentations. My presentation, rather than giving a, a more general overview, will be a very specific study, an individual study that I've recently conducted. So that's the second um, difference with the previous publications, uh, sorry, the previous presentations. My presentation will deal with a study that has not yet been published, rather than looking at previous work um, I've done. Um, my presentation is also not heavily quantitative or mathematical, uh, because that's not one of my strengths. Um, I didn't even um, do A-levels in mathematics uh, at high school. Um, so my presentation will use very simple uh, statistics, I uh, will use lots of graphs. Uh, because I find that an easy way to communicate. Um, and finally, um, my presentation in a way will be, um, rather than generic, will be a bit more personal, especially the first part of the presentation. Um, there's three main reasons for that. First of all, I personally find it very, very hard to listen to people talking uh, for more than one hour. Um, especially if the um, surroundings are a little bit dark and it's a Monday morning. Um, so um, my experience is if you become a little bit more personal, people find it easier to pay attention, at least initially. Uh, the other reason is that my research is very personal, especially my research in bibliometrics, was all generated from <coughs> personal interests. Um, and finally, my rationale is that the audience was probably going to contain a number of very early career uh, academics or mid-career academics. So it might be interesting to hear a little bit about career stories as well. So what I want to do in the first maybe five to ten minutes of the presentation, um, I'll take you to a short career story before I go and present uh, the, the study that um, um, well referred to. So I'm what you call an amateur in bibliometrics. My main research is in international management, looking at multinational corporations, cross-cultural management, um, international human resource management, and most recently looking at the role of language differences um, in international business. Um, and to show you how much of an amateur I am, um, 1993, that's 22 years ago by now, but still fairly recent history. I had a conversation with my then head of department and I asked him, well, how do I know which journals I'm supposed to publish in? Um, I have no clue what the best journals are. So he gave me a quick introduction about what the top journals in the field were. Fast forward to January 2000, which was my first academic job in the UK. The first one was in the Netherlands, which is my country of origin. Um, I am um, not very politely said in one of the meetings, why on earth are we using this stupid uh, journal ranking list that ranks my publication in the Journal of International Business Studies, which is the highest ranked journal in the field of international business, as C on a rank from A highest to D lowest. And all of the other international business journals as D, which is the lowest category, uh, which was incidentally the same as Brickworks, magazine for the building trades, but for some weird reason was also on that list. Um, so I so said, well, I'm sure there's better journal rankings around there, but nobody could point me to any, so I thought I'd go and investigate. Um, I was part of the um, research committee. So I said, well, I'll take it up on me to investigate and find whether there's other journal rankings. And of course there were, 
So in 2000, um, I published the first incarnation of my journal quality list that you refer to. 2015, we read the 56th edition of the journal quality uh, list, which collates about 18 different rankings. And to my big surprise, the journal quality list started to accumulate citations as well. So it's not just journal articles that can accumulate citations, other research products can accumulate citations as well. Um, I am, as previous speakers have indicated, also very critical um, of journal rankings, so it's not that I glorify journal rankings, I see very much what uh, their limitations are and I've published on that as well. And most recently I've become interested in a new <coughs> class of journals that have become uh, named as predatory open access journals, those open access journals that just take your money, provide nothing in return apart from putting a paper on the website. I'm sure that some of you have uh, read the new story about a journal publishing a paper that contains of just seven words asking in not very polite terms to be taken off the mailing list and those seven words were repeated a hundred of times. The reviewer's report was excellent and the paper was accepted. Of course the author subsequently decided not to pay the publication fee to have that paper accepted but they just wanted to prove a point that no peer review is actually happening. Just to get the facts straight, I'm not talking about open access journals as such. I'm talking about predatory open access journals, and there's a world of difference. There are a number of very high quality open access journals. So, citation analysis. I'm an editor in bibliometrics there as well. Um, the very personal, and Wolfgang talked about how things happen by coincidence and how small things can have big consequences. The very reason Publish Your Parish was developed by my husband is that my application for promotion at the University of Melbourne was rejected because I hadn't published enough in A journals. Um, and there was some truth to that. I hadn't published in the top journals in my field. The Academy of Management Review, which we've just heard, was the top. I still haven't cracked that one nor one of the other top three journals, but I could show that some of my work, even though it wasn't published in those top journals, was actually very highly cited and had at least impact in the academic world. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of those citations were not in ISI listed journals, because most of the international business journals were not ISI listed at that stage. So I had to prove in some way that my work was highly cited, but I couldn't use ISI or Scopus. Google Scholar did include, of course, all these journals, but Google Scholar was very useful for citation analysis. So my husband said, well, I can write you a little program, he's a computer scientist. <laughs> it actually accumulates all of the citations and calculates metrics. So that's what, I, what he did, and I reapplied for promotion, and Julie got promoted. So I thought, well, if it can help me, it might be able to help others as well. So I put it on my website. Um, I even wrote a book about it, uh, the Publish Your Parish book, self-published that, which was great fun because you don't have to deal with publishers. Um, and to my big surprise, even the Publisher Parish program began to get cited. And it's by now become one of my most highly cited works. So it's not just journal articles or other research projects, it's also software programs that can get cited as well. So I've done a bit of publishing in this field. If you want to read up on any of that, um, there's the, the journal title. Why am I telling you this story? Well, first of all, to keep you awake um, and make sure you don't fall asleep, uh, which is easy to do at the end of a busy morning, but also to tell you a little bit about the lessons for academic careers. I have found that if you want something changed, you can often make changes as an individual, but you just have to take an initiative. I'm not guaranteeing it will always work, but if you don't do anything, nothing will change. Um, being generous in a way and providing services to others and trying to help others can sometimes bring very unexpected benefits. Uh, I provide a lot of resources for free on my website and I spend many, many hours a week to provide support to people using software or journal ranking lists or simply sending me papers that they want to read. Um, but the result is also that many academics know my name even if they have no clue about my, in my research and have no interest at all. But I have a fair amount of name recognition. 
but you have to be prepared for the inevitable confusion and sometimes downright nasty reactions that you get if you provide a service uh, to the community. Um, a lot of the support requests I get said to say it doesn't work. I have to guess they're referring to publish and perish, I don't even mention that. Um, and it turns out that they haven't switched on the internet connection or they're simply doing the wrong searches. Or I get these funny emails saying, enter my publications in your housing system now. My CV is attached. You're ruining my career because your publications, my publications are not in your system. I hadn't understood that this was Google Scholar, uh, not me sitting up at night entering publications in, in my system. Um, we're all going on strike tomorrow because of the housing index, meaning the H index that kind of got me in the coach. Everyone hates you. That's the French. They use any excuse to go on strike, so I didn't take that one too seriously. But I was seriously upset um, in one particular exchange, and I've had a number of these, um, where one academic said, well, you're discriminating against me because I'm not white. He turned out to be Indian. I didn't know, but of course he thought I knew. Um, I just saw his email. Um, your website should be taken down instantly. I don't understand why you still have a job. The university should fire you. Simply because I refuse to give him telephone support after we exchanged like 10 or 15 emails. Remember, I'm all doing this kind of free of charge. I'm, I'm not getting anything from it. But he was convinced that he knew better how Google Scholar worked, and I was wrong, and I was just refusing to call him because he was Indian rather than white. Um, but overall, I have to say that it's been an enjoyable experience as long as you accept that your research hobby can overpower your real research, and that uh, some, some of the time your real research um, be, um, takes less time or uh, gets less time than your research hobby. I did find though that publishing in another field can be incredibly fun and liberating because it brings you in contact with many more academics than your narrow research specialization. So what we talk about today is metrics versus peer review, and that perfectly complements the two earlier studies, uh, which also touch on the same issue. Um, increasingly, we see an audit culture in academia, uh, where universities, departments, and even individuals are constantly monitored and ranked. Um, national, research access, national research assessment exercises, such as the REF that John talked about, and the ERA, the research Australia, in Australia are becoming increasingly important and publications in these exercises are typically assessed by peer review, um, especially for the humanities and social sciences. Whilst in the life sciences, sciences and engineering citations are often used at least as an additional input to decision making. The reason why citation metrics are not used in the social sciences and humanities is that the coverage in these disciplines, as we've heard before, is deemed insufficient uh, in the websites and scopus. But I think there's a strong danger to peer review as well, because peer review will actually lead to harsher verdicts than bibliometric evidence, especially in disciplines that do not have unified paradigms, such as the social sciences and humanities. If we look at the excellence of research in Australia, we find that the average rating for the social <coughs> sciences was only about 60% of the average rating of the life sciences. On a scale of one to five, um, the average for the social sciences was about two and a half, um, and for the sciences, went up to three and a half, four. Um, this is despite the fact that on a citation per paper basis, um, Australia's worldwide rank, if you look at a country ranking, is similar in all of these areas. If anything, it's a little bit higher in the social sciences than, for instance, in chemistry and in physics. Unfortunately, this low ranking led to widespread popular commentary that government funding for the social sciences should be reduced or removed altogether because clearly the social sciences and humanities in Australia were not world leading and the sciences and life sciences were, so why do we still have the social sciences? Um, similarly, negative assessment of the credibility of the social sciences and humanities can certainly be found in the UK and no doubt uh, in many other countries as well. 
more specifically, I think the danger of peer review um, is that it might lead to what I've called promise over proof. Um, assessment of the quality of a publication might be, even if it's subconsciously, influenced by the promise of maybe the journal in which it's published. John talked about the ABS list, which has rankings of journals. A lot of people then start to transpose that to individual articles. It's published in a four-star journal, so it must be a four-star article. We talked about the journal impact factor that is immediately then applied to individual journal articles or individual researchers. Um, so the journal itself carries a huge framing effect. The reputation of the author's affiliation carries a huge framing effect as well. I'm sure that those of you who are familiar with the field of bibliometrics um, have read the paper where they removed the affiliation of the authors and resubmitted the paper to the same journals that had actually published their paper in the past. Um, they either removed it or they replaced it with some unknown university. I can't recall which of the two, I think it was the latter. Um, the, large, the large majority of those papers was rejected. Um, there were one or two journals who spotted that they published the paper before, but the large majority of those papers was rejected with a less prestigious affiliation. Or the subdiscipline in which uh, the paper is published. Theoretical and modeling work tends to be more highly rated than applied soft work. Uh, so, in fact, peer review might not as ob objective as we think it is. So, as an example of promise, a publication in what I call a triple A journal, because the three top journals in my field all start with an A the Academy of Management Journal, the Academy of Management Review, and the Administrative Science Quarterly. Um, initially means that maybe three or four academics, the editor and two or three reviewers thought your paper was a worthwhile contribution to the field. But what if the paper is subsequently hardly ever cited? I agree. It doesn't mean it's a low quality paper. We shouldn't equate citations with quality. But there is some indication if a paper doesn't get cited even after 10 years, um, it might not appeal uh, to its readers. Then we have a publication in a C journal with more than a thousand citations that at least a thousand academics thought was worthwhile. Okay, some of these academics might have cited the paper because they didn't agree with it. But a large proportion of these people will cite the paper because they think it is a useful contribution to the field. So which is the bigger contribution? <coughs> I'm not saying the second one necessarily is, but certainly we can't just conclude the first one is. So what can we do? Well, first of all, we can remain critical about the increasing audit culture. I've written a critical piece on this. John has certainly written a critical or one or more critical pieces on this. But we have to be realistic as well. I'm a big realist as well. We are unlikely to see a reversal of this trend. So in order to emancipate the social science and the humanities, the inclusion of citation metrics might to some extent help. But in order to do that, we need to raise awareness about alternative data sources um, and different publication practices. Uh, life science and science academics, in particular, write more and shorter papers with more authors each. Um, 10 to 15 authors are not unusual, so <coughs> have more than 1,000 authors. In the humanities, a lot of the papers are single authors. In the social sciences, you might have two or three authors, but more is not very common. We also need to look at alternative data sources and metrics. Maybe have a look at Google Scholar or Scopus instead of the Web of Science. Um, or look at metrics that to some extent correct for differences in career stage and discipline. And I'll look into that in a bit more detail in the remainder of the presentation. But most of all, we need comprehensive empirical work because we can all guess and we can all look at our individual records and see how the different databases compare. But there are dozens of studies that compare two or even three databases, but they typically focus on a single or a small group of journals, a small group of academics, and only com compare a small group of disciplines. Uh, there are very few studies that actually do longitudinal comparisons, so look at how databases develop over time. So, the study that we did um, compares ISI, the Web of Science, um, and Scopus over 
two years, between 2013 and 2015, with quarterly data points, and provides a cross-disciplinary comparison across all the major disciplinary areas. And we look at four different metrics. Again, I strongly believe we shouldn't have one number for an in individual academic. You shouldn't even just have a number, of course, you should have peer review as well, but we certainly should have just one metric. Um, and what we did uh, was we compared 146 associate and full professors at the University of Melbourne, which is the university I worked for before I joined Middlesex. We looked at all main disciplines, uh, the humanities, social sciences, engineering, the sciences and the life sciences, that comprised 37 different sub-disciplines. In each of these sub-disciplines we looked at two full professors and two associate professors, one male, one female each. Um, and we collected data on education, career trajectory, international experience and all that as well, but I won't deal with that in this presentation. We collected citation metrics in the Web of Science, Scopus and Google Scholar every three months for two years, as I said. Google Scholar data through Publish or Perish, the Web of Science and Scopus data in the respective database and then imported into Publish or Perish to um, calculate the relevant metrics. So I'll give you the final conclusion, just in case you, before you, you have to leave before I can finish my presentation. Um, if we compare the five major disciplines um, on the ISI, so data source ISI, metric, HINDEX, the life science average lies about 200% above the social sciences average. If we look at Google Scholar and we look at the higher, which is corrected uh, for the number of co-authors, and the career stage, um, the life sciences, actually, life sciences average actually lies a little bit below the social sciences average. So depending on the database you use and the metric you use, you get completely different results. Okay, let's go into a little bit more detail. The 37 different disciplines are listed here. I won't go through each of those. I realize that disciplinary uh, classifications are always ambiguous. Um, some disciplines might fit into more than one category, uh, but this is uh, the um, final categorization we came up with. Um, it, to some extent, represents the discipline structure um, that we find at the University of Melbourne. So there is a little bit of over-representation of the life sciences and the sciences, which are very strong at the University of Melbourne and an under-representation of the social sciences beyond business and economics. Business and economics is very strong in, in Melbourne, but the other social sciences, uh, there aren't some disciplines that are not uh, as well represented. But overall, we feel that we have sufficient coverage across the five major disciplinary fields. This is the descriptive statistics, um, and as you can see, there is a huge variance in terms of the years that um, academics um, have been active, from three years to 47 years. Um, in terms of the number of papers, uh, running from three to more than 300. Uh, in terms of the number of citations, running from zero, in some cases, in the web of science and scopus, um, to over 16,000 for the highest performing academic in uh, Google Scholar. Web of science, Page index runs from 0 to 54, Scopus from 0 to 48, and Google Scholar from 3 to 65. Um, so there is a huge variance in the data sets. Just to give you a feel for the amount of work that went into the study, and um, I'll give full disclosure here, most of the data collection work was actually done by my co-author, Saduana Kangas, who is a research librarian at um, the University of Melbourne and um, I'm very grateful for her support because I wouldn't have been able to do this uh, all on my own. Uh, we um, collected data, as I said, for two years, um, and quarterly data points for the Web of Science and Scopus, but we actually collected monthly data for a Google Scholar. So, what are the results? Well, first of all, if we look at the longitudinal results, uh, we find that in every database uh, we see a um, relatively modest increase over um, the quarterly data points that do vary between the databases. Um, the average for the Web of Science, the increase is less strong than for Google Scholar and Scopus. So 
Scopus actually shows the strongest increase over the two-year period. Part of that is due to the fact that Scopus has started an expansion initiative um, increasing the coverage pre-1997. As most of you will know, um, Scopus, when it initially started, only included publications after 97, uh, sorry, after 96, uh, but now they're expanding their coverage to pre-96 as well. We find the same results with um, citations. Um, all databases show um, um, a systematic increase in citations over that period, um, which is only to be expected because we looked at associate professors and professors of a university that is highly ranked, so has people who typically are very research active. Okay, let's have a look at the different data sources between disciplines and look at the number of papers first. We see the uh, yellow bars, Web of Science, the blue bars, Scopus, and the green bars, Google Scholar. As we can clearly see, um, Google Scholar <coughs> provides the broadest coverage in terms of the number of papers in all five major disciplines. So it's not like um, Google Scholar, as was true maybe five or ten years ago, um, still has very low coverage in particular disciplines. Um, maybe five years ago, coverage in chemistry, for instance, was still very poor. But now we find that in all of the five major disciplines, Google Scholar provides overall a better coverage for the 146 academic tests. Is that journal papers or any document that Google Scholar? Any document that Google Scholar covers. Um, we also see that Scopus has a slightly broader coverage um, than the Web of Science um, for all of the five disciplines. Um, and we see that overall the difference in coverage is largest for the social sciences um, and humanities. The same is true for citations. Uh, we find the highest level of citations um, in Google Scholar followed by Scopus, although for the sciences, uh, the level of citations in uh, the level of science is slightly higher uh, than for Scopus, but the difference is only marginal. Uh, but again, we find that the difference is largest in the humanities and the social sciences. You can hardly see the humanities um, in the level of science or Scopus, but in Google Scholar, humanities start to look um, very visible. We look at it the other way around and look at the databases and then compare the different disciplines. We see that if we use the Web of Science, we find huge differences between the database, between uh, the five disciplines, with the sciences and the life sciences really towering over engineering and the social sciences and humanities. We still find that pattern was slightly less pronounced when we use Scopus. But when we use Google Scholar, the disciplines all of a sudden are closer together, um, with uh, the social sciences even showing higher citation counts than engineering. And in particular, the humanities um, shows a substantial difference between the three databases. Okay, let's look at another metric, the H-index. Again, we see that if we look at the level <coughs> of science and scopus, there's a huge difference between uh, the disciplines um, and very similar patterns for both the Web of Science and Scopus. Um, if we look at Google Scholar, uh, the difference between uh, the disciplines are far more compressed um, and engineering and social science in particular get much closer uh, to um, the uh, sciences and life sciences. Again, if we look at yet another index, the higher index, which is an index that um, I've introduced with my co-authors in 2014, which is corrected for differences in career length. So it basically looks at the number of years that an academic has been active, and it divides the H-index by the number of years that an academic has been active, because obviously someone who's been publishing for three years will have a lower H-index than someone who's been publishing for 20 years. But it also corrects for the number of co-authors uh, to make an attempt to, uh, to remove discipline bias. I'm not saying that the number of co-authors is the only thing that differs between disciplines, but it is an important factor in um, 
distinguishing between disciplines. With the humanities, generally favor a single author of scholarship, and the sciences and life sciences generally favoring multi-authorship. And again, within the life sciences, within the sciences, there will be huge differences. But the advantage of the higher is that it's not necessary to pick your discipline and say, I'm going to correct for this discipline. No, we just look at the number of authors. So if, for instance, you're a life science academic and you generally publish with only one or two other academics, okay, then you get corrected for three academics. If you're a humanities scholar and you generally publish with 20 other people, then you get corrected for 20 other people. So in my view, it creates a more level playing field because obviously publishing um, a paper on your own generally takes more work uh, than publishing with co-authors. Although some people uh, would argue the reverse. Sometimes working with co-authors can be very time consuming, so it can actually take more work than a single author paper. But I can tell you if you publish uh, a piece with 30 or 40 other people, then you probably haven't put in as much work as when you have a single author. So if we do Sahaya, we actually see a fairly different pattern. Even with the map of science, we see the disciplines coming much closer together. And the sciences and the life sciences still have a higher higher than um, engineering and social science, but the difference isn't as big. Um, if we look at Scopus, we find actually that the sciences and the life sciences, engineering and social sciences are really fairly similar. And if we uh, apply Wolfgang's recommendation, I don't re remember which recommendation it was, but look at the significance levels, they are not significantly different uh, between each other. Then if we look at Google Scholar, we actually find that um, the higher for the social sciences is higher than that of the life sciences, not significantly different, but marginally different. Um, and um, the sciences and engineering are very close together, and even the humanities um, is more than half of the average um, of the life sciences. So we find that with a different metric, the higher, and a different data set, you get very different results. For those of you who prefer tables to graphs, I've put this in a table format. Um, taking uh, the life sciences as the highest performing discipline as a hundred, and then compare the web of science H index. So if the life sciences is a hundred, the humanities is 13. A seventh, or an eighth, I'm not good at maths, um, of uh, the life sciences. If you look at the scope as higher, the humanities. 38 as opposed to 100 for the life sciences, but you can see the social sciences, engineering, and the sciences all are around 1995. If you look at the Google Scholar higher, we find that social sciences out slightly outperform the life sciences, and engineering and science are not far apart either. And as I said before, in the graph form, the humanities score about half of what the life sciences. So again, disciplinary differences are much more than what you would find with the web of science mentioned this. And then a little bit of simplistic statistics. If you run a regression analysis, um, if you use the ISI H index, um, gender, rank, and discipline differences explain nearly 60% of the variance. If we use the Google Scholar higher, the explained variance is only 14%, and we find a dramatic reduction of differences across level of appointment and across disciplines, as we would expect, because this metric attempts to correct for differences in terms of academic age, and people who are at an associate professor level will generally be younger than people who are at a professorial level, and differences across disciplines. Okay, and for those of you who prefer words over graphs and tables, a quick comparison, if you look at the H index um, and ISI data, the life sciences um, outperform the humanities by about 8. The average H index for the life sciences is 27, the average H index for the humanities is 3.5. They outperform the social sciences by about 3 times, 27 versus 9.5. If you look at the higher and use Google Scholar data, the life sciences 
outperform the humanities to 552. Um, the life sciences are slightly lower, as I mentioned early on in my presentation, than the social sciences. So again, dramatic difference. But then, we talked about levels of aggregation, looking at a country level, looking at a journal level, looking at a university level, looking at a department level, looking at my sample of 146 academics on average. But what does this mean for individuals? Because we might find that for a single individual, one particular database might give inaccurate results. Um, I compared um, Google Scholar and Scopus um, publications, citations, page index and Maya with the Web of Science for every individual academic um, and found that um, there were really no academics for which um, Google Scholar publications, citations, page index and higher were lower than for the Web of Science. It was one um, academic that missed one particular paper, which unfortunately was her most highly cited paper. But given that she was author number 1497 on 2000 uh, authors, I didn't feel that the, the highly citedness of that paper was really representative um, of her record, especially given that all of the other papers uh, were not very highly cited. So both Google Scholar and Scopus missed that particular paper simply because they couldn't cope with so many authors on um, one individual paper. Uh, the other differences were caused by the fact that the Web of Science had actually listed um, all 16 book chapters of an individually authored book as separate publications. So the Web of Science lists 16 publications, but it was simply 16 book chapters of a single author book, which we would normally consider to be one publication. It was nice of them, because at least it, it gave the academic more publications, but it's not something that we would normally do. Um, Scopus, um, in comparison to the Web of Science, uh, in about three quarters of the cases, Scopus provided higher publication and citation metrics, but in the remainder, uh, the Web of Science um, provided higher levels. Um, Scopus mainly performed poorer for older academics. Remember, we talked about the 96 cutoff that Scopus initially only included publications after 96. They're now expanding, but obviously, some of my academics who have been publishing for 46, 47 years. Some of the publications were clearly way before 96, so not all of those were included in Scopus. In general, um, I found that in Scopus, the sciences and the life sciences were published a bit more than the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, Scopus tends to have better coverage in comparison to web of science for the social sciences and humanities. So what is my conclusion? Well, will the use of citation metrics disadvantage the social sciences and humanities? That's what everyone says. We can't use citation metrics for the social sciences and humanities because um, they will perform poorly and everyone will say that this is not appropriate. I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, not if you use a database that includes publications that are important in those disciplines, for instance, books or journals in the local language, which might be important in a lot of disciplines. Not if you correct for differences in co authorships. Is peer review better than metrics if we talk about large scale research evaluation? I think there's little debate that if we look at individual records, we would always, as your graph showed, we would always use peer review in preference and maybe a little bit with metrics. Uh, but if we're talking about large scale research evaluations, is peer review really better than metrics? And that is what John began with. Yes, in a way, it is better. Um, the ideal version of, of peer review, which I would say is informed, dedicated, and unbiased experts, is always better than in the metrics. Especially if we're talking about the reductionist version of metrics, looking at only one database that gives preference to the sciences and the life sciences, um, and if we use only at one metric. But if we look at the inclusive version of metrics, if we use the Google Scholar higher or the Scopus higher, I think it's probably better than the likely reality of peer review, uh, which in a lot of cases are hurried semi-experts 
um, who have, um, as John calculated for us, 600 papers to, was it 600, I think? 600, 600 papers to evaluate um, in the space of two months. And they're not sitting down two months non-stop to evaluate these 600 <laughs> papers. They still have their other jobs as well. So I try to calculate how many hours they have per paper, and I think it's probably a couple of minutes uh, per paper. Read the title in the abstract. Yes. The <laughs> yes. So they're probably influenced by the journal outlets and the affiliation of the author. If the author works for the University of Oxford, chances are that they will be evaluated better than if that author works for the University of Middlesex, my current, my current employer, because that's an ex Polytech. Um, more of a teaching-oriented focus traditionally, not anymore, but reputation efforts. So in research and evaluation at any level, and here we have the same conclusion of all of our presentations, uh, we need to have a combination um, of peer review and metrics wherever possible. But if reviewers are not experts, I think metrics might be my preferred uh, alternative. Um, and if metrics are used, we need to use an inclusive database, especially if we look at the social sciences and humanities, um, and we do need to use career and discipline adjusted metrics. So, um, the article I've just presented has been resubmitted to Scientra Metrics yesterday after the second round of revisions. So hopefully it will be accepted and impressed soon, and you can read the whole story <laughs> online. For now, if you have any questions or comments, I'll be happy to answer them. And I think we probably, I have no idea what the time is, we probably still have a bit of time, so <coughs> if there are any questions about the other presentations um, as well, I think we can.